Okay. Um, only for the record, um, to introduce some dazzling young writers that I've had the honor to work with. I was in the fifth grade and sitting quietly in the cold, bright, white room. The metal table in front of me was empty, which had to mean we weren't doing any experiments today. We usually went to the science lab for an hour on Fridays. We spent the rest of the class time, save for another hour allotted to art, in a different room on Tuesdays, in the classroom. So if we weren't experimenting, why were we in this stale singing place, instead of the sunny room where my homeroom teacher waited, I wondered. In the next moment, the lab director, Mrs. Davis, came in. She was wearing the same white lab coat she always did for science lab, so it made me think I was wrong. She, she soon changed my mind again when she held up a tape. We're going to be watching a video today, she said. I sat up, since a video might have meant an omen for a looming pop quiz. I flicked off the lights. It turned the room dark blue, making a glow from the television in the corner shine brighter. While on the screen there was deer that trotted along a grassy field. A voice of the monotone man, the narrator, told us that we were going to be learning about the life cycle. I tried to stay up. The speaker was slow and hypnotic as a lullaby. My eyelids flickered until an image of a fox appeared on the screen. The creature in the film looked even drowsier to me. His eyes were closed. His fur was bright orange with tufts of white and his tail on, an, on his paws. The tips of his ears were black. He was curled up in the grass while the sun shone, adding a yellow sheen to him. So long as I focused on him, I could pay attention. This fox has just died, the speaker said. I frowned. Did the fox look like he was sleeping? Did sleep and death really look so much alike? At ten years old, I didn't know much about either subject, so I assumed that death would leave more of a mark on a creature. Let's see what happens to his body over time, he said. Suddenly, his voice gained inflection. He seemed excited. Although I never saw Miss Davis click the remote, the video seemed to move and fast forward. The radiant fur was swallowed by inky ants. His eyes turned to hollow gapes in his face. The orange was peeled away into white, his muscle to bones. His mouth opened slightly, as if he let out one last breath from his rotting lungs. I gaped at the body that was left when the fast forwarding stopped. I held my breath for a moment. In the next, the scene changed, and the fox was forgotten by the voice of the film. I was now awake. My eyes were wide and barely blinking, but I could not focus on the rest of the video. I didn't say I was scared. I already gained a reputation at my elementary school for being a crybaby. No other kids seemed affected, so I let my feelings fester for the rest of the school day. I didn't tell my parents either. They were as sick as my of my weepiness as everyone else. When I got home, the first thing I saw was my family room's couch. I sat down on it, dropping my hefty backpack besides me. It was on the soft felt couch that was streaked and colored forest green. It reminded me of the green grass where the fox had died. I blinked, and there was a fox, resting right next to me on the couch. The fox gas. His flesh was being gnawed at again. The empty sockets of his eyes deepened into black, again. Its chest turned to a meatless rib cage again. I hopped off the couch. I picked up the strap of my backpack, but its smooth texture seemed to turn to fur and then to flesh and then to bone. I dropped it and ran for my parents' room. Neither of my parents were inside, but the sleeping fox was on the edge of their quilt, a covered bed. He now had two friends. One was next to the TV, on top of their cabinet, and the other over my mother's nightstand. In tandem, they all decayed. Their fur and bits of skin spilled over the shiny towel of the ground. I ran again, this time to my room. The whole time I knew none of the foxes were there. I chanted it in my head like a mantra. The foxes aren't there. The foxes aren't there. Stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. My mental wishes did not stop the sleepless nights where the ghost of rotting foxes appeared. It was a week before they truly vanished, or at least they stopped haunting me with haunting frequency. I was wrong about death not leaving a mark. Thank you. This was the night the fire would rise. 
it was the first showing of The Dark Knight Rises, but not just the third movie, all three movies. It was a marathon. It was a marathon of all three movies in IMAX. I was ecstatic. I was that eight-year-old kid running around the house wearing a cape and hiding in the dark, waiting to strike fear into criminals. The showing started at 6 p.m. To make sure I was the first in line, I arrived at the theater around 4. I was the first. I had my Batman shirt on, nothing fancy, but the look of joy filled my face. After a few minutes, my friend Eric showed up. I turned to him, and in my Batman voice I say, Eric, tonight the Dark Knight rises. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Michael, I know. I grab him by the shoulder and shake him as if I was trying to revive the dead. Swear to me we're going to have fun. <laughs> I swear. While in line, our other friends showed up, Gabby, Gracie, and Jose. They couldn't join us, but they got a different showing. Ten minutes later, they started to let us in. I was jumping around like a maniac, as if I had a sugar rush that could last for hours. The smile on my face was impossible to put down. The world could literally end at four in the morning, when the movie ended, and I would be okay with that. Eric and I take our seats to watch Batman Begins. I grab him, and I, I grab him, and I pull him close to whisper in his ear, It begins. <laughs> Throughout the whole movie, I run, my arms run up in the air and rushing everywhere, sm almost smacking Eric in the face several times. My chair is the equivalent of a bounce house. I'm drunk on excitement. The movie ends, and we're given a 10-minute break. I start to laugh like an idiot. Eric has a look on his face that said, Good, Michael's having fun. And yet, it gave a questionable look as to why my friends were this lunatic. <laughs> Ten minutes passed, the dark night started to play. The theater went quiet, and once again, I was like a clapping seal receiving a fish for a treat. Then we got to the Joker's first scene. I froze in fear and in delight. With a smile, on, you can say that a smile was definitely placed on my face. I grabbed Eric's arm as if an alien was going to burst out of my chest. That one scene made the whole movie what I expected. Smart, witty, bone-chilling, and everything a Batman should be. I was pretty sure at the end of the movie I had left some fingernail marks on his arm. Maybe a, maybe a bite marker one. Finally, it came. Finally, the moment came. What the whole night has been brought up to this point. The Dark Knight Rises. I leaned, into, I leaned to the edge of my chair to the point of falling off. I did not move for the next two and a half hours. I turned my head to Eric, and I just stared. I think he was afraid that I might do something, but I did nothing. Just stared at him and gave him a grin as if I was Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Then I slowly turned my head back to the screen. The movie ended, and I felt like a bomb, ready to explode. I started to talk as if I was Batman himself, making jokes left and right, laughing at the plot holes and whatnot because... They just did not make any sense. All I knew was that at the end of the night, I had fun. Your brother is a fag. The voice came from the desk behind mine. Was he talking to me? He never talks to me. It's not me. Her brother is so gay, said a second voice. My chin brushed my right shoulder. From the corner of my eye, I saw three of them. They were looking at me. Your brother is a faggot. I turned my body to face them. Two were sitting, and one was standing. Past the boys, I saw Miss Portugal. She kept her desk behind our backs. Miss Portugal looked up from her papers. Her eyes met my dripping ones. Miss Portugal looked back down and continued writing. My name is Bianca. And the name of this piece is Abuelita. I assure you that unless you have an abuela, Yaya, Nona, or Oma, this story will not make much sense to you. And if such is the case, I'm not exactly sure how you're still alive without the advice of your grandma. The music was booming through my $15 speaker so loud that my lipstick was moving at the beat of Joel Randi. It was Friday night, which meant anything could happen. I was only 16, but my parents had already gotten used to the fact of me going out practically every weekend. That night, there was a party in Brooklyn, and all of New York's illest dancers were going to be there. From b-boys to poppers to voguers, there was no way I could miss this ordeal. 
My best friend and partner in crime, Jessica, already told me that she couldn't make it. She had gotten punished for the weekend before when we got home around 5 a.m. My grandmother, nosy as ever, overheard the conversation and saw my futile attempts in trying to convince her to disobey and come anyway. I tried bribing her. You know, Renzo and Zina are going to be there, and Renzo asked about you last weekend. He's expecting you to come. Come on, we won't get home that late, I promise. No, 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 this time I really promise. I let out a frustrated sigh, and that was her cue. Tú sabes que quizás Dios te está diciendo que no hayas. Abuela, I'm sure that if God is telling me to fight for my right to party, in spite of my adversary, and aren't you praying your rosary right now? Isn't there something in the Bible that warns against nosy people? Bueno, mija, I'm just trying to tell you what I feel. El que no oye consejo, no llega viejo. Instead of heading, heeding to the wisdom of my grandmother, I mocked her. Well, I guess that's a good thing anyway. I don't want to get old. I sprayed my perfume on every area of my body possible, kissed my grandmother goodbye, and she gave me la bendición as I rushed out the door. That night began amazingly. I easily replaced Jessica with Jamie, and we started pre-gaming. We smoked a few L's, drank a few shots, and we stumbled down the streets of Washington Heights. And we went up the stairs to the train of 207 in Vermilia. As we reached the platform, we realized the train was coming, and I still hadn't bought my Metro card. Mind you, the train comes every 15 minutes, and I didn't have a second to waste. Jamie grabbed my hand and pulled me so close that with one swipe of the metro card, we were, both, we were both through the turnstile. As we were both about to step onto the train, I yelled, we made it. Jamie's smile slowly turned into fear when she saw two men dressed in black shirts and jeans yell, you two, come over here. Friggin' undercover cops. Typical for cops in New York, they gave us tickets and of course flirted with us while they did it. Dogs. By the time we were done, it was almost midnight, and we still had to take two trains and a bus to get to the party in Brooklyn. We were determined. By the time we got there, it was 2.30 a.m. The party was over, everyone was drunk, and Zeno was making out with some other girl. I got home at sunrise, miserable, sober, and with a $158 ticket. The next day, my mother punishes me for three weeks, and my grandmother walks by with her rosary in hand and says, Te dije. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, while I'm up here, I will be reading a piece um, by Adrian Suarez Avila, who was not able to make it, and it's called Chocolate Por Favor. The street is busy with men and women on bicycles. A man sings Guantaramera in front of a bodega while holding a beer bottle laced with a rosary. I listen to my cousin's suggestion and follow the crowd of children pulling their mother's patched up dresses, leading them to the house where ice cream is sold. I want vanilla, mommy, a young boy yells out beside me. His feet are bare, and he looks hungry. An older man stares at my polo shirt and my name brand shorts, taking a few seconds to look at the checker pattern decorating my shoes, my Americanness. I know I'm not welcomed. You can have vanilla, the mother responds. She continues talking, mentioning something about her husband, chocolate, and the baby at home. But I focus my attention on the girl in the front of the line. Give me a pound of strawberry. I hear her telling the lady in charge of the business a miss of the cries, the moans, and all the forms of sound oppression can take. We're all out, mi vida, Fidel's orders. Then, chocolate, por favor. The lady in charge sets her scooping spoon aside, takes the girl's tin cup, and dips it in the container holding chocolate-colored liquid. This, I am told, is Cuban ice cream. The girl pays for her treat, runs her finger along the trail of the chocolate that follows through the side of her cup, and licks it. She looks at me, get closer, and smirks. Have you decided to follow me around now, she teases. I'm not trying to scare you away, I respond. My name's Marisol. My dad picked me up before you could even ask. I know, I heard him yell it out clearly yesterday. I'm Adrian. She tells me that, her hermanito's name, that that's her hermanito's name and tells me to walk with her. On the way out, I hand over my own tin cup to my cousin and give him some coins to pay for his order. Remember the revolution, he whispers. And I, as I said out into the, dirt, into the sidewalk, she looks a lot simpler today, attaching to herself none of the prettiness that caught my attention yesterday. Still, I think to myself, there's something delicious about her, something that not even the poverty of this town can spoil. She hums whenever a horse-drawn carriage passes by and stops to face me when the street dirt rises in the air. Men whistle as they pass us by on their bicycle and she blushes. Does your dad know you're this popular, I ask? Ay, que comico eres. My dad doesn't have the time to worry about that. Really? He looked pretty concerned yesterday when he saw me with you. Well, she pauses. She thinks about her response. 
slicking back the lock of dark brown hair that tickles her cheek. You're not from here. I was born here, did you know that? Yeah, but you're not one of us. This troubles me, and she knows it. One of us? The only passport I have is one with Cuba's coat of arms, I think to myself. What are you then, I ask, dragons? Your government, your politics, aren't ours, she says, unsmiling. We reach a squeaky bench at the park. No children are present, only an older gentleman with a pizza in one hand and a cup of guarapo in the other. He sits on the floor. A pair of teenagers hold hand and kiss under by a banyan tree. They don't care who's looking. Marisol sets her tin cup on the floor, slicks back her hair behind her ear once more, and waits for me to speak. Do you believe in what your father believes, I ask? She stays silent. Looking down at the light steps, she makes a ground, she makes a ground give life to the dust. It's not about my father. You have to believe and show that you believe if you want to eat, if you want to live. That sucks. That really sucks. But we still have fun here. It's not entirely awful. Prove it. The old man rises and passes us by in the front. The crust, of, the crust and the cup from his meal stay behind. Marisol sighs, smiles, and stares at me. Tonight. Meet with me tonight. I sat on the floor and waited for her to start. This was my favorite part of the day, after my morning cartoons and fresh out of the shower. I played with my delicate pink pom-pom socks as I waited for her to come with my favorite red brush in her always glossy manicured hands. It was her brush, and the fact that she used it on me made me feel grown up and special. This was our time, the time Abuela set apart just to be with me and chat about everything that was going on, like me getting a new Lisa Frank notebook and my super cool Hello Kitty stickers that playfully decorated my Barbie lunchbox. <laughs> she sat in her beige and white recliner in her room, and I sat in between her legs in the, on the blue carpet, which became a deep ocean every time I was bored and jumped all over her furniture. I exchanged playing with my pom-pom socks for playing with her red-painted toes. She hated it, but it made me laugh. Then I, she said, handing me two hair ties, and began brushing my untamable curly hair with the patience of a saint. As she parted my hair down the middle, she told me about her adventures of traveling all over South America and her visits to the homes of various presidents. I always pictured her and my grandpa on a purple magic carpet, just like Aladdin and Jasmine, except in South America. I waited for her to finish with my curly pigtails and ran to grab my favorite bows. After all, those were my personal touch. Delicately, without moving one frizzy curly hair, she tied the bows around the, hair, around the hair ties and sent me off to finish my homework. I paid her with my invisible credit card and with a big hug that filled me with her lavender scent. Good afternoon. Um, excuse me. Heads or tails? Tails. Most excellent. <laughs> this is my story, Delirium. The desk attendant released the phone from her shoulder and jammed it back into its base. She rubbed her eyes, digging into her tanned wrinkles. Señores, solo quedan tres asientos disponibles. What do you mean three spaces, my mother asked. The attendant huffed out. She turned to her assistant. The assistant said, okay. On this flight, we can only take three more passengers. We're sorry. There's nothing else we can do. My mother's eyes welled up. She tried uttering something. She looked up at my father. My father looked down at her. He stroked her cheek. It's okay, he said. Everything will be all right. Three hours away, in the midst of empty terminal seats, I sat, holding my three siblings close. My father turned to look at them, then me. I nodded in his direction. My father, brother, and I stayed behind. My mother and I, I mean, my mother and both my sisters left on the plane. We were trying to make a connecting flight from Miami to Peru, then to Chile, where we would visit my grandparents' camps in the rustic southern point of the country. In getting to the camps, we would enjoy the green mountains running across the horizon. Past us, the faded road would wind along hay meadows. The road would end before the dusty ground of the camp entrance. The entrance would be chilled. Pockets of light would peer in through the beech branches. Grapes would rail overhead. The air would be filled with this ripe sweetness. This trail, fixed with dead underbrush, would lead us to old brown faces, pouring from weathered shacks. 
one face, an eldest, would come shaking to me. She would press my hand against her face, sob into it, kiss it, and whisper, Nicholas, if I had never left, this would have been my name. Then she'd pull me into her shack. Then I'd see my great-grandfather's carbine rifle, etched with marks for the hundreds of Andean foxes he hunted. I'd see my great-grandmother's pendant, darker than onyx and cold and silver, fixed from a meteor found in El Valle de la Luna. I'd see my grandfather's watch and see stricken Bible and my grandmother's worn out poetry books. I'd see my mother's pa paints and canvases and my father's reading glasses. If I had never left, this would all be mine. The eldest would light an incense and walk back outside. The eldest would forget me. I'd turn and find a caving back door. I'd step through the door and I'd end up at the end of the country in a meadow of wet and thick fern. I'd walk through it, following the sound of a stream. I'd find the stream, lit in heat. I'd step closer and stare into its black depths, seeing the wavering white and black trout circle each other. I'd allow myself to step in and submerge into the brisk depths. I'd allow the water to envelop me within and burst my lungs. If the water revived me, I'd allow myself to come back. I'd allow myself back home. But instead, I was sitting at a steel airport seat, watching the 26 rerun of a Samsung tablet commercial. The terminal was a bright expanse. It was a great pathway of black tiles sectioned along with eight waiting areas of countless steel rows. There were three magazine kiosks with no attendance. Spanish announcements constantly came on. The brief silences between it made it more daunting. My brother whined over how cold it was to find sleep. He hadn't brought his sweater. He thought carrying it would be as overwhelming as going into exile. My father didn't have his sweater either. I had to give up mine. I didn't mind, though. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep. But seeing my brother slumped against my shoulder and my father dozing off himself, I felt calmer. I believed that all would be resolved tomorrow night, that I would go back to my country and it would be all right. Part three. I watched dawn approach over the airfield. It crept in slowly. I watched the sky lighten into blue, then pink, before becoming a space of swirled clouds and orange heat. When my father and brother woke up, we went to have breakfast at the terminal restaurant. The restaurant had a shady bar and a dining area set up as a patio. The menus were poorly printed. The chipped chairs were glossy red. The round tables were enameled with discolored designs. Each of us ordered the American breakfast. It consisted of wet scrambled eggs, four slices of sweet ham, and two slices of dark ciabatta with a warm juice and oversweetened coffee. We took the time to taste each thing. We managed to smile how it all was. We stayed there most of the day. We ordered more weird items, including a milkshake my brother retched on. We laughed at that. We watched people pass by, like shadows, anxiety trials on some of them. Part four. The next morning, we were having breakfast at the restaurant again. We weren't smiling. We weren't laughing. The second flight got canceled. Part five. I'd stared at that other bitch the whole time. I slumped back and my eyes were weak and packed with the ceiling light. I wanted to undertake that light as malicious heat and fry her face in. Then I'd disintegrate the rest of her being onto the floor and kick her dust away. Her dust would go and fade easily too, for existence was as inane as that smirk. She had just taken the last three spaces on the third, third plane. She took them even though her brother said she'd like to spend more time in Peru. She took them even though her husband said he'd feel better about skipping Sheila this time. She took them even though they hadn't stopped to even take a shit and then she already, and they were already late. She took them even though the attendant said she'd have to pay extra for her carry-on. She took them even though she saw my brother crying and my father holding him. She took them even though she saw my glare and after she saw my glare, she took them with a smirk. She told the attendant the extra fee was okay. She told her companions that everything would be all right. I stared at that other bitch that whole time. Part six. I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid we can't let you into Peru. You don't understand. My sons and I have been here for three days. We're exhausted. My eldest one just got assaulted. Please, we just need a hotel. Part seven. 20 minutes before. I didn't sleep for four days. I didn't sleep the day before the trip. I didn't sleep the three days after. I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep. My brother lay across a, f a row by himself. He stared at a tile. He was resting. My father sat opposite him. He stood at the same tile. He was not resting. He had finally managed to get through to my mother. 
He couldn't forgive himself for the things he said. He told her how this was all shit, how he regretted to travel, especially to a worthless country. My mother said she regretted him. I don't feel well. I'm going to the bathroom, I said. No one responded. Something was heating itself in my stomach. When I got up, it shot across my body, up to my head. My vision flickered, and I felt as if my insides were missing. I stumbled against the nearby wall and held onto it. I paced myself against it. Each step made me feel the emptiness. When I entered the bathroom, I nearly saw it in the mirror. It was something that lurked over my eyes. I went directly to the glass. I tried looking closer at it, but I screamed and back away. I felt it go under my ribs and thrust them up. When I caught my breath, I looked at my reflection. I was sweating. I was grasping my chest. I blinked, and then the bathroom was coated in blood. I saw my torso sliced in half and my ribs hanging open like bat wing doors. My organs were missing except for my heart. My blackened heart dangled by a vessel and, and it swayed like a metronome. I closed my eyes again. Holy hell, no. No, that didn't happen. That wasn't real. I tried stepping forward, but I slammed into a mirror before me. I stepped back and walked into another mirror. I turned around and I was surrounded by these mirrors. My reflection appeared in one mirror, smiled at me, but disappeared before I could focus on it. As I turned around to try to find it, I felt it laughing. The more I turned, the more the mirror closed on me. I screamed and crouched onto the ground. The mirrors were gone. I charged up to the sink and held up myself against it. I was gasping into the sink. I got up, supporting myself on the faucet. I saw my face. I was damp and dying. I was grinning and crying. I looked deeper into my eyes and found it. It was a gleam, a gleam I hadn't seen before. A gleam that shined like a trail of broken glass set under flames. A gleam that shined from abysmal shadows. A gleam ignited under the rapture of my psyche. A rapture exacted from my lack of sleep. I slammed my palm into the mirror. Its, its entire frame shook. I smacked it again and then punched it. I stood back, never losing contact with the gleam, and tossed a stronger punch, cracking the mirror. I winced and looked at my hand. It was sliced and blood was coursing through. I dipped my hand into the sink, letting my hand sting under the hot water. I looked back at the mirror. A blood stain divided two large shards. On one side, my face was shocked. On the other, my face was smirking. The gleam was still there. I looked back down and saw the entire sink filled in my blood. As my blood overflowed, a dead trout surfaced up. As my blood poured out of the sink, the black trout slid out and clasped onto the floor. A white trout was surfacing next. I stumbled black. I stumbled back, slipped on the blood, and struck my head against the wall. When I stirred back, I was sitting on dry tile. My hand was bloodied. The two large shards had fallen. Where have you been, my father asked. The bathroom. Why are you shaking? I'm cold. Okay, let's try to go to foreign customs. Maybe we can switch our tickets and go back home. Okay. My father carried my brother. I walked behind him. We stopped and asked the janitor where we would head towards, where we should head towards. He pointed us out to a door he had to open. He smiled at me as we went in. The door led us to a dim corridor. The corridor was long and dusty. It led down to another door. The window of the door glowed. As we walked closer, it glowed brighter. I walked ahead toward the growing light. Slow down, son. I ran and slammed the door open. The door smashed into a wall and the echoes seized the air. I looked past a crowd of travelers into a gift shop. By a stand of postcards, a lady stood. With the stand, with the slam, she looked up at me. She wore a pinkish dress like a capuche bellflower. Her black hair shined, her black eyes flared with mysticism. Her brown skin also glistened as dew, dew that would evaporate and lift as morning mist. She radiated this transience like an aura. I took a step towards her. I noticed her eyes widen. I had my face grabbed and thrown into a wall. Que carajo haces aquí, carro? Through his meaty fingers, I saw I was being held back by a policeman in green uniform. I was tossed back harshly. I felt my head moistening the wall with blood. I fought to look back at the crowd. Through the crowd that had gathered, I looked and saw no one there. Last part. I'm sorry, sir. I just can't let you in. As you've said, you were supposed to go to Chile. Not here, sir. Please. We just need a place to fix all of this, a place to switch tickets to go back home, a place to bathe, a place to rest. We just need home. I'm sorry, sir. You won't find that here. Sir, wait, why are you angry? Sir, everything's going to be all right.
I was sitting in my brother's small dorm room, watching the Australian Open, one of the four major tournaments in tennis. Our favorite player, Roger Federer, was, wa was facing off against another of our favorites, Rafael Nadal. They were tied, one set apiece, for all in the third. Our eyes were glued to the screen. There was a knock on the door. The players were in the middle of a 22-point rally. Neither, us, neither of us wanted to move. After the second, slightly harder knock on the door, my brother muted the television. I hopped up from the chair and opened the door. My body was grabbed by massive hands. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. My thoughts were scrambled. I stared at my brother, who was by then dashing towards me, except he suddenly stopped. My brother's face had changed from concerned to terrified. Then I saw what he saw, a gun. I let out a heavy shriek. I felt the veins in my head engorged with blood. My mouth was covered by the same hand holding the gun. Hot tears ran down my face. I was dizzy. The hand uncovered my mouth and pulled the gun up to my forehead. My brother begged him to wait. He tried to talk some logic and reasoning into him to no avail. I felt the hand tighten around the gun. I shut my eyes tight. I realized then how much my body was shaking. I slowly opened my eyes and locked them with my brothers, hoping my eyes could show the feelings I had for him, for everyone else that I loved. I needed to make sure that he knew. Then suddenly, the pressure on my forehead from the gun vanished. I turned around to look into the eyes of the figure that grabbed me. He smiled and said, nigga bored. He turned around and returned back to his room. I heard the door close behind him, followed by the loud rap music that floored through his iPod speakers. <laughs> Vodka tastes like bile. I've thrown it up too often. Right now, I don't care. I don't care that the drink in my hand tastes more like vodka and less like orange juice. I don't care that we are drinking with complete strangers behind the mobile gas station. The only thing I care about is James's cold eyes still burned in the back of my heart. I've come to the level where every drink tastes like water, and I'm mighty thirsty. The guy I've been talking to walks over to the vodka bottle standing on the ground to pour me another drink. Andrea standing next to the bottle, twirling her long blonde hair while flirting with the other guys. I already know they're going to blow up her phone all week. Little do they know, she's all about the attention and not the actual deed, but then again, which 17-year-old girl isn't? I know I'm not about the deed either, which is why James broke up with me. I walk a few steps backward and bump into the wall behind me. Here comes my drink and the guy whose name I don't even know. He hands me the red cup and puts his hands on the wall, leaning in over me. I feel like I'm slowly fading into oblivion. Every gulp, another push. I come to and we're still behind the gas station. His lips are on mine and I don't even know how they got there. I don't want to kiss him, he's so greasy. I think of James. I feel a pang of guilt in my stomach. No, wait, that's not guilt. I push Mr. Greasy off of me and stumble past the other guys, still standing in the dim light of the gas station sign toward, towards the bathroom door. Where's Andrea? I heave the blue metal door open, fall to my knees on the filthy floor and begin to vomit. The door falls shut behind me. Shortly after, it's being opened up again. This must be Andrea. Andrea, I say, close the door, but the door doesn't close. Yeah, Andrea. I hear the guys outside mocking me. Close the door. To my surprise, there's no snappy answer from Andrea. The door falls close behind me, and the lock is turned. I try to scramble to my feet, but I can't. He yanks me up by my arm and throws me against the heating mount mounted on the wall. The metal edges step into my back. I can't stand on my own. He pins me against the wall with all his weight. I try to push him off but it's like trying to move a boulder. No, I repeat over and over again as he grabs my breasts and reaches between my legs. My words come out like a mumbo. He has complete control over me now. He begins to try to tear down my jeans. I'm still a virgin. No, I say again, this time louder. Suddenly there's a bang against the door from the outside. Hey, 
I recognize Andrea's voice. What the fuck is going on in there? It sounds like the angels are singing to me. I draw together all the strength I have in me for one powerful help. The door bursts open. He steps back from me, causing me to fall directly into Andrea's arms. He tried to rape me. I sop into the shoulder of Andrea's jacket, trying to get her to move. She's looking back and forth from the group of guys to my attacker, who is still standing in the door frame of the bathroom. We need to get out of here. Please, let's go. I beg her and begin to pull her toward the front of the gas station. You fucking pigs, she yells at them as we start to back away. She puts her arm around me, steadying my walk. Run, she says, and we run as fast as we can. The lights of the city fly past us in a constant blur. We find refuge underneath this light on a playground. We're stuck here. The trains won't run for another three hours. I pull up my cell and call the only person that could possibly come rescue us now, James. He answers. James, I sob. It's so strangely, strangely relieving to hear his voice after all that happened today. James, please come get us. This guy tried to rape me and we're all alone out here. There's a short silence on the other line. I'm already home. Sorry. This is in my mother's voice. This is her, her story. This is about my mother's father. The first memories I had of him was his voice. He had a beautiful voice and could dance too, but he was much better at singing. He sang when he woke us up, a voice strained from a night shift spent working, a tired voice, but still beautiful. Every morning, when it was his turn to take us to school, he would wake us up. The most annoying, stupidest song ever. Tá na hora, tá na hora, minha gente, tá na hora de acordar. It's the, it's the hour, my gentle ladies. It's the hour to wake up. He'd wait for me and my little sister to get dressed and eat breakfast. Then we'd wait on him to do his daily routine of cleaning the car. Cleaning isn't women's work, he would say. We scrubbed the bathroom floor spotless. Same for the car. None of us could sit inside as he'd go like a maniac, wiping dashboards, picking crumbs off seats while I leaned against the door to our house, dressed in my school clothes, the Roman Catholic school kind of clothes, hoping I wouldn't sweat in them, hoping I wouldn't be late again. He'd always make us late to everything. Even when his sister was getting married, the bride had to wait on him to arrive at the wedding. I bet he was cleaning the car that day too. Anyways, half an hour later, the car looks brand new. Minus a few dents. I always asked him how it got damaged, and he always responded with something like, oh, I parked the car, and then wouldn't you believe it? Someone came and hit me. I always asked him how it got damaged, and he always responded with something like, oh wait, I knew he was lying. That was it. He had shards of windshield glass in his arm from dents. Eleven times he'd been in accidents. I was always scared that he'd die in one. But I felt better when he hugged me. His glass shard arms were muscular and felt strong when he embraced you in them. Those were arms that felt safe. I hated it then when he used those same arms to turn the wheel of the car. He was the worst driver ever. He sped through every turn, hoping to arrive on time, and we knew we'd still be late. I sat on the right back seat, and by the end of the ride, I'd be on the left. Thankful that I survived yet another drive with Dad. Mom usually drove us, but some days he'd be our chauffeur, zipping along, half asleep, dangerously close to other cars, all the while listening to English music on the radio. He didn't know English, but he liked the way the sound so sounded. His favorite, broken English, was I see trees of blue, clouds of white, something, something of the day. I love the night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. He could sing in English, but when he spoke Portuguese, 
he spoke it like he had too much money and not enough places to spend it. He'd only finished the fourth grade, but he borrowed some words he had from rich clients that came to the bakery he used to work at before his current job. He was proud of me when I did well in school, and even prouder that I could speak English, Spanish, Japanese, and German. He paid for lessons, much to my mother's chagrin, and by the time I was old enough to work, I taught others English and got better at it. He didn't value just being smart, though. He would joke, É melhor tendo uma pessoa burra que trabalha, em vez de tendo uma pessoa esperta que é lazado. It's better to have a dumb, hard-working person than a smart but lazy one. I liked his jokes. When I take too long choosing what to wear, he'd go, When I was young, I know, Dad, I know. I'm just saying, when I was young, I had one pair of shoes and two pair of clothes, the one I was wearing and the ones that were washing. He still lived like that, even when he had money. We had to beg him to buy a new pair of pants and search for himself. He just spent it all on us. I'd say one day, oh, I like strawberries. And he'd buy boxes and boxes of them. Until I had to say, stop buying strawberries. I'm sick of them. If you're coming over for a party and he knew what food you like, he'd have it ready by the time you got there. My mom cooked, though, since that was the only thing he couldn't do, right? He couldn't cook to save his life, and he couldn't fix anything. I fixed it, he would exclaim, and I searched closely until I could see a sticker tag that he'd forgotten to throw away, the hint of a gleam on the shower head from being new, or like a hidden empty box from the store. My mom cooked, and he cleaned, and together they'd throw parties for family and friends' birthdays and dances. My father taught me how to dance. If he couldn't teach me something, he'd spend the money to get it for me. My mother said no twice, once to hang gliding lessons, once to a motorcycle he wanted to get for me. He liked fast things. He never saved the money. He just spent it all on us. He lived like he would die young. If I'm not here, take care of your brother and sister for me, okay? He said as he stared into my eyes. Stared with a long, tan face and dark, short-cut hair. Gripped my shoulders tightly with those muscular arms of his, attached to his skinny, long-legged body. Stared in my dark brown eyes with his green eyes. Green like the shallows of the water on the beach. Green like the leaves of the trees in front of our house. I was young when he said that. I was young when I looked into his eyes and he looked into mine, until he could no longer keep staring, until he could no longer gaze in a straight line, until he could no longer see with those green eyes. They took him to the hospital when that happened. He never had a vacation in his life until those three months spent there, being told they had diabetes, being told he couldn't eat most foods anymore, being told he couldn't get angry anymore lest he raise his blood pressure. He loved sugar. My mom would bake cakes for him all the time and he ate tons of them. When he left the hospital, we had to hide the sweets. Sometimes though, there'd still be a slice of cake missing when we checked back later. And then one day the house flooded. There were cockroaches in the water, power lines were down. I had to walk carefully for fear of being electrocuted. Before leaving the house though, dad went straight to the kitchen opened the fridge door, and ate the pudding. Why did he do that? The pudding wanted to be saved from the flood. He ate, even though he knew it made him worse. Even though he knew he had to keep his sugar in check in order to keep his sight. My mom wouldn't cook feijoada for him anymore, so he'd buy the ingredients himself and sneak them to a friend at work who was a chef and could cook for him. He couldn't drink Coca-Cola anymore, which he loved more than alcohol, because it was worse for him now than alcohol. He loved food, he loved eating it, he loved giving it to others, and now he couldn't have it. I sat there, staring at the hospital bed, stared at the husk that laid there, the arms, no longer muscular, stabbed with little tubes through which food went. He had been angry when they told him how long his second vacation would be. 
He had been angry when they told him it would be only a year. He couldn't enjoy time off work. He just had to lay there. Today was a bad day. I came in and saw two green daggers leap at me. The man on the bed was in pain and didn't know who I was. The man in the bed was in pain and wouldn't be in bed very long. It wasn't a year yet. It was too soon. I stayed there a long time until I couldn't stay anymore. Until I had to leave the man on the bed, the stranger with the green eyes, whose arms were sticks, sticks that could not wrap themselves around another stranger, sticks that could not comfort. That night, after I was no longer in that room, I wanted him to go. I wanted the man to stay, but not be in so much pain. I prayed for the pain to go away, for him to pass on and no longer feel it. I prayed for him to die. I sit at the restaurant. My mother sits across the table, my half-sister next to me. They just came in from DC, and we wanted to show them our new house, our new home. She has such clear eyes, like my father. We sit at the table and clap when the guitarist finishes another song. As we get up from the table, my half-sister dawdles over her newborn son, and we ask the guitarist for two requests. As we pay, play, pay the bill, the girl from Ipanema plays. And as we leave, I hear, And the dreams that we dream of once in a lullaby.
I'm happy because I'm happy. happy. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is awesome.